Hi everyone, my name is Professor Tanya Hertz, and today in Business 100, we will be covering leadership, which is chapter 14. Again, this is an introductory overview chapter of leadership. There is so much to learn about leadership. You can, I, I teach a course at SDSU on leadership. There is an organizational behavior. There's also, you can actually get a, a business degree, a bachelor, an associate's, a bachelor's, or even a master's degree in leadership. So this is an introductory course. We'll just, we'll skim the surface and give you the basics and, and hopefully this will be helpful for you in your everyday life in working in, in a business setting. I know after reading a lot of your posts that many of you have lots of business experience. So go ahead and open your PowerPoint slides to chapter 14. Reminder, if you need any support, uh, always reach out to me if you would like close captions on the videos that's at the bottom of the screen there's a little box that says cc use that and we'll go ahead and get started here in just a, a, a little minute just a minute let me go ahead and see. there perfect okay so for a business to thrive and grow it has to utilize its resources and it has to use those resources efficiently and this can only be achieved through effective management. Managers are able to reach organizational goals by planning, by leading, by organizing, and by controlling the organizational resources. Now, I said just a moment ago that we need to, as managers, control those resources in, in a manner that's efficient. However, the opposite of efficiency can often be seen uh, or, or the result, rather, of efficiency um, is often seen as unhappiness, dissatisfaction. When you strive solely for efficiency and ignore employee satisfaction, there are very significant detrimental effects that can happen in an organization. So I'll ask you this question. Just think about this for a second. Does it matter if your employees are happy? Does it matter if they're satisfied? Do you think it matters? Does, do you care if they're happy? Do you care if they're satisfied? Well, it should matter to you. And even if, even if there is just absolutely no kindness in your heart, no altruism at all, you should care about employee satisfaction and happiness because there are so many research studies out there that support, that show that satisfied employees produce more. Satisfied employees are better employees. It leads to higher levels of profitability for the organization. There are so many correlative studies that show that satisfied employees are less likely to leave an organization, thereby reducing the turnover and lowering the costs associated with, uh, with, with selecting and, and, um, and hiring and training new employees. Um, satisfied employees are, are important in an organization. I think most managers today see that. All right, so talk about the levels of management, uh, top, middle, and um, supervisory or lion level managers. Um, top level management, middle management, first line management, they're the three basic management levels that can, found, that can be found in almost all, at least mid-size or, or large uh, scale organizations. Top managers, uh, they're responsible for articulating the vision of the organization, establishing priorities, um, uh, really more big picture, high level um, goals in the organization. Middle managers, they are uh, more responsible for communicating up and down the pyramid in an organization. They're responsible for coordinating teams, etc. Now the line managers, they're responsible typically for that um, direct supervision, uh, they train, they motivate their employees, uh, all the non-management employees. And modern day managers require a number of different skills in order to be effective and efficient managers. These skills are divided into three categories, technical skills, human skills, and conceptual skills. Leadership and coaching are two examples of human skills. To succeed, all managers should have all of these skills and managers can need, if you want to be successful in management, you have to be prepared to learn new skills. 
So there are a couple of different theories of motivation that you'll look at in your organizational behavior classes and your leadership classes, and we'll touch on them briefly here. The first is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and the second is theory Y and theory X. So Maslow, it's, it, I know it, there's a W there, and so you might think it's Maslow, but it's actually pronounced Maslow. And even though Abraham, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs is not particularly, was not designed for the workforce and wasn't uh, based on the workplace, it really can be related to motivation needs at work. And the, the needs that we'll look at are uh, physiological, safety, social, including belongingness and self-esteem, self-actualization are all on that table and we'll look at those. I think I have another slide. Yeah, I have a slide right here. So self-actualization is the top. So the theory of Maslow's theory is, uh, essentially states that in order for an employee or a person to move up in the pyramid of, of needs, the, the, below, the lower level needs need to be met in order for him or her to move up and up and up. And so that means essentially that uh, an employee will not seek for things like uh, societal, societal acceptance or belongingness if at first uh, her, his or her physiological needs aren't met. So if they can't afford to eat, if they can't afford to put a house, uh, a roof over their heads, they're not going to be um, seeking those higher level needs. Now, this, you can see how there are problems with this theory. This is a, a pretty old theory of, of needs. You see how it makes sense that we need to meet those basic needs of the employee if we expect them to, to achieve higher level needs. But also, this doesn't explain things like, if you're a starving artist, why are people looking for things like self-actualization or social belongingness? if they um, don't have those basic needs met. So it doesn't really, it, it, it's useful for, it's useful for establishing those, um, or, or understanding the needs, but it doesn't totally explain the whole picture. And I, I think that uh, there are better theories out there. Um, one of the theories that I really love uh, when we're talking about management is theory X and theory Y. Uh, this was developed by psychologist Douglas McGregor and his study on motivation. And the study essentially states that management's attitudes towards employees directly affects, uh, directly affects their behavior. And there's two types of managers. There's theory X and theories Y manager. Now theory X managers uh, or the theory X assumptions that managers make about their workers that is that workers don't like working, that they, um, th that the only way that you can get people to work is really through co coercion, through threats, that people want to be told what to do, they like to be micromanaged, and theory Y assumptions say, no, that's not true. People work, work is part of life. Work is as natural as breathing. It's as natural as, as, as play. People don't uh, you know, hate to work. They know that they need to go to work and they, and they want to be, um, you know, motivated at work. They can self-direct. They can, they can, they can, um, they want to meet goals themselves. They'll, they'll seek responsibility. They want, uh, bigger challenges. And we found through this, this theory X and theory Y that which of these theories do you think is more, uh, satisfying for employees? Which kind of managers do you, do you think employees want to work for? Do they want to work for these sort of uh, uh, micromanager, uh, threatening managers, or do they want to work for, for managers who understand that, that people want autonomy and they want to direct themselves? Well, people research supports that people like working for theory Y managers. They don't want to work for people who, um, who, who direct, who threat, who control, who yell, or who harass. Uh, they want to work for, for people who understand that, um, that understand that, that work is, is part of life, uh, life. So according to this, um, expectancy theory in the theory X and Y, um, theory, workers will be motivated if they believe that, uh, their efforts will lead to good performance and a meaningful reward. And that's very true. 
And according to this theory, people won't be motivated if they believe that the relationship between what they contribute and what they earn is different from the relationship between what others contribute and what others earn. So if they don't think that the system is fair, they'll contribute less. Um, so there's a great, I, I'd love for you, if you get a chance, uh, if those of you who have Netflix, there's a movie called Happy on Netflix that talks about, uh, you know, it's not directly about wor worker satisfaction and happiness, but uh, people in general and why it's important and what we can do as humans in order to, to be happy. Again, employees tend to be more satisfied uh, if they work for theory, why managers, they tend to, um, they tend to, um, they tend to like working for people who understand that, that, that work is just part of life. So I wanted to talk about one other thing um, in terms of job enrichment. We haven't talked about that yet, job enrichment. So uh, of all of the different things that can make people happy at work, there are so many different things, so many different factors that come into play. And oftentimes uh, you'll ask somebody, oh, what, will, what, what makes you happy at work? And you might think it might be something like, well, money, how much money do I get paid? That would make me happy. But really that has a very, very, very tiny impact on whether or not employees are satisfied or happy. What matters more is the work itself. And the, and the factors that have the biggest impact on whether or not our employees are satisfied are, uh, in terms of the work itself, the variety, the identity, the significance, the autonomy, and the feedback that we get from those particular jobs. So by that we mean, if a job has, requires many different skills, rather than just doing an efficient job where you do the same thing over and over, it tends to be more motivating and it makes employees happier. Task identity is the degree to which we understand that or we get to see the entire picture of what we're doing rather than just working on one tiny part. So by that I mean it's more motivating, challenging, exciting, and um, satisfying to be, for example, a furniture maker rather than working on an assembly line where a piece of furniture goes by and we're just a knob turner, right? Also, significance plays a big role in how, how um, motivating and exciting our jobs are. Um, significant, by significance, we don't mean how significant the job is to you. We mean the, the impact that you have as a worker on the lives of other people. So jobs that are intrinsically significant are things like, like a professor or a, a, a physician or a firefighter. Things where we're helping other people tend to be very satisfying and motivating to our employees. Autonomy, people, so you, you know what that word autonomy means? It means the degree to which we have freedom to do what we want in our jobs. We like autonomy. We like as an employee to be able to decide how to do our work and when to do our work without being micromanaged and without being told every little step of the way. And finally, feedback. We like jobs that intrinsically give us feedback. Now, by feedback, I don't mean that our manager is saying, good job, Sally, you worked hard today. That's feedback, but that's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about the job itself giving feedback and telling Sally that she did a good job. So a job itself that gives feedback would be something like firefighter, right? The job, just by very nature, if you're putting out a fire, you know you did a good job because the fire is out. Or a surgeon, right? They know they did a good job because they didn't kill their patient, right? Terrible example. Sorry about that. But that's what I mean. So a good way to remember this, an acronym is V-I-S-A-F, V-S-A-F, uh, V-S-A-F, uh, Variety, Identity, Significance, Autonomy, Feedback. If a job has those components, those five components, it's likely to be more satisfying. If it doesn't, there are things that we can do as managers in order to make the job more satisfying, to make it more interesting by, by, by essentially altering the job itself to have those five components of variety, identity, significance, autonomy, and feedback. All right, moving on. So what do, what, do, what do employees do? Well, we can actually alter the jobs themselves in order to, to, to incorporate the components of that job characteristics enrichment model, or we can use other types of motivation tactics. Um, 
anything we can do to make our employees more, pro more, more engaged, more productive, more excited. Um, and there are correlative studies that show that some things are more effective than others. Working on the job itself or changing the job itself is the number one most effective way of making the employees motivated. We can also emphasize their health and well-being, showing that we care for them um, and uh, making it easier for them to do their job. Giving them sabbaticals or time off from work, uh, particularly for employees who've been there at least a year or more, or, or other non-traditional benefits like uh, doing things like providing childcare or, or giving the employees a way to get things done while they're at work, or nap pods, or um, or ping pong in the break room. Anything that shows our that we care about our employees, and we're giving them a little bit of freedom from their work. All right, so let's talk a little bit about planning. So effective management uh, depends largely on how well things have been planned out. Right, a good plan is one where the organization can keep track of the functions without curbing flexibility and responsiveness. And the plan needs to be able to respond to, to changes both inside and outside the organization. And there are different types of planning that all managers need to be uh, engaged in, but depending on the level of the organization, you might be responsible for different types of planning, either strategic, um, strategic tactical, operational, or uh, involved in some sort of contingency planning. And like I said, depending on where you are in the organization, uh, chances are you'll be doing different types of planning, and you can read the definitions there. So slide 13 here shows that businesses tend to focus their plans on issues that are most probable, right? That makes, so se makes sense. Also, beyond most probable, excuse me, they'll also focus on, <coughs> sorry, uh, events that are potentially harmful, or both, or both. And one of the most fundamental parts of the planning process is the strategic planning, right? Because um, all other management decisions are based on those strategic plans. And the mission statement states the reasons for the existence of the organization. That's a type of strategic plan, right? Um, typically that's done by the executives in the organization the high-level managers in the organization. Uh, another type of planning that, that typically is done at, at more of a higher mid-level is SWAT planning. Uh, SWAT planning is, is, if you haven't done it before, uh, SWAT stands for Strength, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. And these are types of plans that evaluates the organization both internally and externally. Strengths and weaknesses, when we're evaluating those things, we're looking internally. Right? What are the strengths of the company and what are the weaknesses? And then opportunities and threats, we're looking outside of the company externally. Uh, what are some opportunities that we're not taking advantage of now that we potentially could? And what are some threats on that competitive environment that might come in and ah, threaten us? Right? All right. So in the strategic planning process, um, the some of the things that we do is we'll set the strategic goals, right? And it's important we're setting those goals that we make sure that the goals are very specific and that they are measurable so that there's some sort of quantifiable or number attached to them. We want to make sure that, that we have uh, some sort of uh, time associated with them, that they're time bound so that we know this is when we start, this is when we finish. So, so we can measure again, efficacy and they need to be realistic but challenging, right? So um, without a plan, if, if a plan is not challenging enough, it doesn't push the organization to grow and to, to, to move forward. Um, and one thing I wanted to say about planning, the lessons that you learn from one planning cycle, it's so important that those lessons are incorporated in the next planning cycle. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the organization of the company itself and some key considerations about the way that we actually organize the company. Um, it's essential that we, that, we, that we set up the structure in such a way that it will help management to actually achieve its goals. There are a lot of different ways that we can set up the, the structure of the organization and different considerations. Um, and we'll look here in, in a minute at the org chart. I think I have an org chart. Do you have one? 
Yeah, I have an org chart. So this is an example of an organizational chart which shows the company's formal structure and, and, and where power flows in the organization, where decision-making flows, uh, who has more power th th than the person above them. And this is a, a very traditional hierarchical uh, org chart. The reason I say hierarchical, like a hierarchy, right? So it's almost like a pyramid where the power is at the top and it flows down. We also need to consider things like span of control, right? How many people each manager will supervise, right? And then uh, departmentalization. So each of the groups in the organization functionally should be divided into whatever group makes sense in the organization. It may not be functionally. It could be something like geographically or it could be based on you know, the, like the product or service that they're working on. It depends. Organization, whatever makes logical sense in the organization, but it needs to be clearly defined, delineated. And all of this, where do you find this information? Where does all this information go? Typically, it goes into the handbook of the organization so that, so that employees have um, access to this and they can see uh, the way that their organization is structured. So, uh, this is the uh, three different organizational models. Uh, they're as follows, line organization, line and staff organization, and matrix organization. But these structures aren't necessarily independent of one another. Um, so in a line organization, each uh, employee is accountable to the person above him or her. It's very simple. It's, it's um, a simple chain of command, top to bottom, right? Um, but what was I going to say? Oh, line and staff organization. The line and staff organization, the line managers form the, the primary chain of authority and the staff departments work together with the line departments. And in the matrix organization, specialists from the different departments will work in different departments on a more of a, um, uh, well, they'll work on projects in different departments temporarily. It's typically temporarily. Now, it doesn't, when I, I'm giving these organizational models, like I said, they're not necessarily, it's not just one and, and not all of them. A lot of organizations will have some combination of the different types of organization styles within their organization. Makes sense. Okay. And then uh, leadership styles, there are several different ways that power, that power is used in an organization. And the way that power is used typically defines the leadership style. So. If you look at the, the primary types of leadership styles, autocratic, democratic, and free reign, these are also, um, oops, sorry, free reign leaders are also um, often called, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, laissez-faire leadership style, laissez-faire, where they, where they step away and they're not, they're not essentially doing much management. Laissez-faire is French for let it be, right? Autocratic leaders tend to be the type of leaders who, and remember, we're talking about power here, who, who hoard the power for themselves. They're not consultative. They typically make decisions and then expect people to follow those decisions without question. Democratic leaders tend to solicit help from their subordinates before they make decisions. They can, um, they can even sometimes totally give up the power and let their subordinates make the decision free from their intervention, depending on what the decision is. And then um, laissez-faire or free reign leaders um, typically let people choose themselves how to um, follow their goals. The reason why it's not, it's called free reign and not completely laissez-faire because in laissez-faire uh, leadership, uh, the, the leader wouldn't even set the objectives, right? They would, they would totally give over everything to, to the subordinates and not even set the objectives, which isn't really the most effective type of leadership style. Um, so oftentimes, um, leaders will tend towards one style more than another. And there are some styles that are better than others. Autocratic leaders are typically not People don't like working for autocratic leaders. They typically, uh, with autocratic leaders, don't um, experience high levels of satisfaction. Productivity goes down. Between democratic and free reign, it depends on the situation. And every leader will use a different leadership style or more than one leadership style in his or her 
role as a manager. And it often depends upon the importance and severity of the decision itself. Um, even so me personally, I tend to be somewhat democratic or more free reign in the approach that I take to leadership. But there are times when I'm autocratic, when I don't consult my subordinates. And it's not because I don't care about what they have to say. It's typically I'll do this in decisions that aren't that important or um, where um, I, or that are very important and I don't have a lot of time and I have to rely only on myself. So like I said, leaders will, will often oscillate or vacillate between the different styles, but um, in purely autocratic leadership styles, people don't enjoy working for that type of leader. All right, finally, talk a little bit about controlling. So controlling is, is the process of monitoring people, um, making improvements um, in an organization. It's so vital that managers understand that their, understand their place in the uh, organization and understand their responsibility when it comes to con controlling and understand that they're responsible for um, things like performance management, right? performance management or, or controlling. Um, it's important that when you set up the, the, the performance management system that it's clear what, the, what is expected of the employees from the management that, that when you're measuring performance of your employees that it's not done haphazardly or based on the leader's own personal preference or, their, um, or, or done subjectively. It needs to be very objective. It has to be, there has to be standards in place it has to be clear to the employees, and um, and if something is found in the performance management, um, you know, when you're meeting with your employees, it's so important that you approach the discipline process like a, I always say, like a hot stove. I use the hot stove analogy. Discipline needs to be immediate. So just like if you were to touch a hot stove, it burns you right away. It has to be the same for your employees. If they do something wrong, you need to respond immediately. It also uh, needs to be impartial. It needs to burn everyone the same. I don't care if you and I are buddies and we go out to eat um, you know, together after work sometime. I don't treat any of my employees any different, nor should any manager. Um, and it has to be, uh, so it has to be immediate, it has to be impartial, it has to be free from bias, um, and, um, and if you follow those steps, then, then that'll be a fair process that the employees can be proud to work for. So that's chapter 14. I will see you all in chapter 15. Have a great one, and talk to you later. Bye, everyone.